Hello everyone. My name is Sandra Sainsbury. I grew up in New Jersey, but I moved from the state of New York to Cyprus a long time ago. Do you know anyone from New York? Today, we're going to read a story about an amazing woman from New York in a book called I Descent. Ruth Bader Ginsburg Makes Her Mark by Debbie Levy. Are you ready to get started? Let's do it. I Descent. Ruth Bader Ginsburg Makes Her Mark. Written by Debbie Levy. Illustrations by Elizabeth Badley. With permission to read by Simon and Schuster. You could say that Ruth Bader Ginsburg's life has been one disagreement after another. This is how Ruth Bader Ginsburg changed her life and ours. She has objected. She has resisted. Disagreement with creaky old ideas, with unfairness, with inequality, Disagreeable? No. Determined? Yes. In 1940, Little Ruth's neighborhood was vibrant with immigrants, people from Italy, Ireland, England, Poland, and Germany. Jews from Russia, like Ruth's father, Nathan Bader. People from different cultures with different holidays, foods, and traditions. But in all these families in Brooklyn, New York, and in families everywhere, one thing was the same. Boys were expected to grow up, go out into the world, and do big things. Girls, girls were expected to find husbands. Ruth's mother disagreed. Celia Amster Bader thought girls should also have the chance to make their mark on the world. So she took Ruth to the library. On the shelves were stories of girls and women who did big things. Ruth read about Nancy Drew, girl detective. She discovered Amelia Earhart, daring aviator. She learned of Athena, goddess of Greek myths. Here were independent girls and women taking charge. Ruth read her way into this world. Around her, the sweet scents of books blended with savory aromas from the Chinese restaurant downstairs. Delicious! A girl could be anything. Sometimes Ruth and her parents took car trips out of the crowded city. As they drove past a hotel in Pennsylvania, Ruth saw a sign, no dogs or Jews allowed. This is how it was in those days. Hotels, restaurants, even entire neighborhoods announcing no Jews, no coloreds, no Mexicans, whites only. Ruth and her family were Jewish. This was prejudice, pure and simple. Now it was Ruth's turn to disagree. She disagreed by never forgetting how it felt to read such words. She never forgot the sting of prejudice. In elementary school, Ruth was excellent in some classes and less excellent in others. Her favorites were English, history, and gym. In those, she did quite well. But then there was handwriting. Ruth was left-handed. Back then, teachers told left-handers they should try and write with their right hands. Ruth's right-handed penmanship was so bad 
she earned a D on her penmanship test. She cried. Then she protested. Ruth protested by writing with her left hand from that day forward. And it turned out she had quite nice handwriting. Ruth also had a little problem with sewing and cooking. These were her least favorite classes, but girls had to take them. Boys took shop where they worked with saws and other tools. Ruth objected. She wanted to take shop. She wanted to handle a saw. She didn't get what she wanted. It may have been unfair to girls and to boys, but Ruth was learning that sometimes life was like that. Ruth loved music. She especially loved opera. In music class, she lifted her voice in song. This time, it was Ruth's music teacher who objected, gently. Ruth simply could not carry a tune. The teacher asked Ruth not to sing out loud in the chorus. Ruth kept on singing, in the shower and in her dreams. She continued to adore opera too. By the time Ruth was in high school, friends and teachers knew her as an outstanding student, the tom twirler, cello player, and newspaper editor. As graduation approached, Ruth was chosen to make a speech at the ceremony. But she had been keeping a big secret. Her mother was terribly sick. The day before graduation, Celia Bader died. There was no agreeing with this. There was no disagreeing. This simply was. Ruth did not go to her graduation. She did not give a speech. Still, Ruth knew what her mother wanted. Three months later, she left home to attend college. Not many girls went to college in the 1950s. Ruth made friends, but she also met girls who excluded Jews from their clubs. She met boys who thought girls should be looking for husbands. And then she met Martin Ginsburg. Marty was tall and funny. Ruth was small and serious. Marty could make her laugh. They fell in love and hatched a plan. After college, they would go to law school, both of them. Lawyers, Ruth had learned, could fight unfairness and prejudice in courts. People thought it was a fine idea for Marty to attend school. They didn't think Ruth should go. A lady lawyer? People disapproved. Ruth disapproved right back. So did Marty. They got married. They went to law school. And they had a baby, Jane. Ruth's law school class had a total of nine women and 500 men. She studied mightily and tied for first place in the class. And yet at graduation time, no one would hire this brilliant new lawyer. Why not? She was a woman. Men didn't want to work with a woman. She was a mother. Men thought a mother wouldn't pay attention to work. She was Jewish. Many people were still prejudiced. Three strikes against her, but Ruth was not out. She resisted and persisted. Finally, a judge hired her and she worked like mad for him. After that, one law school hired her and then another. Ruth became one of the few female law professors in the whole country. And she did it with a new baby at home, 
James. Ruth had disagreed and worked her way into becoming a lawyer and professor. But around her, other women were excluded from jobs. When they did get jobs, they earned less than men. They were kept out of important roles in courts and government. To make matters worse, the Supreme Court of the United States, the highest court in the land, approved all this. As one Supreme Court justice had written years before, the natural and proper timidity and delicacy which belongs to the female sex evidently unfits it for many of the occupations of civil life. In other words, women and girls were too shy and weak to do big things in the world. Another Supreme Court opinion declared, woman has always been dependent upon man. Ruth really, really disagreed with this. So Ruth went to court to fight for equal treatment of women. The most important cases went to the Supreme Court. The first time she appeared there, Ruth was so nervous she feared she might be sick. But standing before the nine Supreme Court justices, Ruth imagined them as her students. She, Professor Ginsburg, needed to teach these students, who were all men, why a person's choices shouldn't be limited just because they were born a girl. Ruth wasn't only fighting for women. When women were excluded from the work world, men were excluded from home life. Why shouldn't a father stay home to care for his children and cook their meals? Why shouldn't his wife run a business? These were fresh ideas in the 1970s. Ruth did not win every case, but she won enough. With each victory, women and men and girls and boys enjoyed a little more equality. Sometimes Ruth and Marty's children received confused looks when they said, that their mother argued cases in the Supreme Court and their, fa their father made the family's dinners. People found this strange. Sometimes Ruth and Marty's children received confused looks when they said that their mother argued cases in the Supreme Court and their father made the family's dinners. People found this strange. Ruth. Marty, Jane, and James did not concur. They kept on being the type of family they wanted to be. And dinners at the Ginsburg home were delicious. Marty was a successful lawyer, but also a marvelous chef who had mastered the art of French cooking. Ruth, her family knew, had mastered the art of a burnt pot roast. Ruth became well known as a lawyer, so well known that President Jimmy Carter chose her to be a judge in Washington, D.C. Then Ruth became known as a first-rate judge and President Bill Clinton asked her to be a justice on the Supreme Court along with the eight other Supreme Court justices, her job would be to decide the most significant cases and answer the most difficult legal questions in the United States. Ruth agreed. In 1993, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg became the first Jewish woman on the nation's highest court. In each case, the Supreme Court considers, after hearing from lawyers who argue for each side, the nine justices take a vote. 
The side that gets the most votes wins the case. The justices who agree write an opinion to explain the court's ruling. When Justice Ginsburg votes with the winning side, she wears a special lace collar over her robe. But many times, when the Supreme Court announces the decision, Justice Ginsburg disagrees. I dissent, she says. And she writes her own opinion explaining why. Plus, she wears a different collar just for dissenting. I dissent, Justice Ginsburg said, when the court wouldn't help women or African Americans or immigrants who had been treated unfairly at work. I dissent, when the court rejected a law meant to protect the right of all citizens to vote, no matter their skin color. I dissent, when the court said no to schools that offered African Americans a better chance to go to college. Justice Ginsburg can be very convincing. In one dissent, she explained why the court was wrong to rule against women workers who were fighting to get paid the same as men. Congress and the president agreed with her and passed a law to undo the court's ruling. Justice Ginsburg had disagreed most often with the legal views of Justice Antonin Scalia. But they didn't just complain. I dissent. No, I dissent. They shared their conflicting ideas. Each pointed out weaknesses in the other's arguments. And after the opinions were written, the two justices had fun with each other. They didn't let disagreements about law get in the way of a long friendship. Here they are parasailing in France and riding an elephant in India. Justice Ginsburg is now the oldest member of the Supreme Court. Some people have said she should quit because of her age. Justice Ginsburg begs to differ. She works as hard as ever. She exercises in the gym. She never misses a day in court. She attends the opera, gives speeches, and travels. Many have cheered Justice Ginsburg for her persistence and independence. They've called her a rock star, a queen, a goddess, a hero. Of course, Ruth Bader Ginsburg isn't a rock star, a queen, or a goddess, but to many, she is a hero. She made a change happen, and she changed minds. She cleared a path for people to follow in her footsteps. Girls in college, women in law school, and everyone who wants to be treated without prejudice. Her voice may not carry a tune, but it sings out for equality. Step by step, she has made a difference. One disagreement after another. The End Since the publication of this book, in 2020, Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away at the age of 87. However, her extraordinary life, as we read about in this book, lives on. Ruth Bader Ginsburg spoke up when she disagreed with something, and she never gave up on her dreams. What are your dreams, and what will you do to achieve those dreams? I hope you join me and my colleagues on another reading adventure with the U.S. Embassy. We can't wait to see you again. Bye.